Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vidhu Sharma, and today I'll be sharing some pragmatic insights on decision making. So let's begin. Did you know that on an average, a human being makes about 35,000 decisions a day? Now, these could be as big as deciding the future of the world or as small as choosing a drink. But yes, a human mind goes through so many countless number of decisions that they need to make every day. And if that wasn't enough, do you know how many decisions you make just to choose a drink or a meal? 250. Yeah, you know, you love that coffee or latte, but the point is you make a, a huge number of micro decisions or choices before actually taking the first sip. Hi, my name is Vidhu and I'm a product manager. I love to call myself as a product optimist for the fact that there are so much that the products can do to alleviate mankind. I have about 15 years of experience of which 11 have been as a product manager. And over the course of 11 years, I've learned and led teams building products across desktop offerings, hardware, mobile, and web platforms. Previously, I had worked at organizations like Intuit, Logitech, and Adobe, to name a few. Currently, I'm a lead product manager at Atlassian, building platform capabilities that power some of our most iconic products. I hold an MBA and an undergrad in engineering. In today's webinar, I'll be covering three broad areas. Some of the common cognitive biases that hinder effective decision making. Some of the product decisions you make in shaping the, uh, the future of your products and the decisions you need to make to grow as a PM. So let's talk about the most common biases first. There are six biases of decision-making. Some of them are more common than the others. So let's jump right in. The first stop is confirmation bias. This is one of the most common forms of cognitive biases. So basically what's happening is when you have a preconceived idea or a notion, one tends to overvalue the evidence that confirms to it and undervalue the evidences that misses or dismisses your preconceived ideas. And most of the time, you don't even know you're doing this. But hey, all's not lost. You can do a couple of things to avoid confirmation bias. For example, trying to find the evidence that disapproves your idea is maybe a good place to start. Try to find the reasons of why something will not work because it's very easy to find the reasons for why something will. And always rely on your teams and peer PMs to keep you honest. The second most common cognitive bias is the hindsight bias. Now you have a gut feel. You've tried something, it works. Everyone's excited. You've made the big game plan. And now you started engineering your feature or productionizing you know, the capability. And suddenly during testing, things don't seem to work out as you wish they were. You know, For all you know, things only work out 20% of the time. So having, not having an oversight of those things uh, causes you to lend into the hindsight bias. So hindsight bias causes events to look predictable when they really are not. And they can only pan out in a certain way after the event has occurred. Now let's look at the sunk cost bias. Well, this is one of the most classical forms of biases that a lot of projects get into. So you, when you've invested enough money, time, and, and resources that cannot be recovered, you try to make decisions to keep lingering or keep carrying on. Sometimes it's easy, but sometimes, most of the times it's tough. You only get out when you've lost a lot. So imagine you spent a hundred bucks on a, a classical Broadway show you want to go to. Now you bought the ticket, but you know it's raining, it's very cold outside, you're not feeling well, but you still make the decision to go and attend the Broadway because you've already sunk hundred dollars into it. Uh, but you end up getting unwell after the fact that you really enjoyed the show. So sometimes a human mind just keeps on carrying because of the sunk cost that has gone in. So in order to avoid such biases, think of treating or starting or closing a project or a feature as a new decision, not an ongoing decision to something that's already sunk. The next stop is the base rate bias. 
In probability in statistics, base rate is the underlying probability unconditioned by prior events. For example, uh, let's say a, a user clicks on a certain button one third of the time. Now, this seems pretty huge for you know, a, a product button or a click usage. But if they only click that button for 1% of all their activities, well, it's not that bad. So sometimes in, because as PMs, we are bombarded with heaps and heaps of metrics, uh, not knowing the base rate uh, doesn't give us a clear picture of what kind of decisions are to be made with those kind of data. The availability bias. So this is an interesting one for the fact that this applies to some of the most common things or the most common ideas that are turned down. For example, when an idea is presented, the mental shortcut, the shortcut is to associate it with something that you already know or have learned before. So the idea gets turned down. But in hindsight, this idea may actually be a good one. So we are affected by easy, vivid, available examples. In order to avoid the availability bias, try to look at it from a different perspective. Try to uh, merit the idea based on its own unique advantage and its own unique strengths. And the overconfidence bias. So when you're on a roll, you've done some big assignments and something screws up, uh, you know, you feel overburdened. You feel that, hey, something is lost. Because you've been on roll on something, because a few things have worked in the past, or some decisions have been really good and fruitful does not mean uh, the future is going to hold the same because every decision is different. It has different dimensions and different outcomes. And this usually happens because sometimes we just oversimplify things or uh, maybe we just make sense of we have a lot of expertise and we believe this is the right thing to do, but that's overconfidence bias kicking in. And what happens is you may not end up preparing properly in order to make a right decision. So if you, if you look back, some of these cognitive biases really hamper or really limit the scope of decision-making, which affects you as a product manager. Now let's talk about the three dimensions of decision-making that shape your product. We'll talk about velocity, the depth of decisions, and the ownership. All the decisions that happen out there fall in one of these or many of these buckets. And if you find a good way to approach these, you'll make some really solid decisions. So let's begin with the velocity. Now, as a PM early in my career, I thought that I was responsible for all the decisions being made in the product uh, that are in my remit. And there was a moral obligation to decide everything or be on top of everything. But boy, I was wrong. That was definitely not the case. So as a PM, you do own a lot of decisions. You do own a lot of key decisions on what markets to enter or what pricing and packaging strategies to go forward with. But most of the times as a PM, you're owning the velocity of decisions. For example, to pick one technical stack over the other is an engineering decision. To choose a certain design element is a design decision. But as a PM, since you're at the center of um, all these activities, it becomes a task for you to drive these decisions uh, in, in the quickest possible way, in the shortest possible time. So what happens is once you can start connecting the right people, teams, and gather them to making a decision at the earliest, you get decisions that are solid. Sometimes the best decisions are uh, the ones that, that happen really quickly, and the worst decisions are the best choices that you never made. So, so think about it. For example, think about the sunk cost bias. Uh, if you keep investing in a certain area, just trying to delay it, and you, if, you're not, if you're being indecisive, you're not investing other in other parts of your roadmap or other capabilities that you could have built. So as a PM, try to make sure that you own the velocity of decisions and you try to get to the end result as soon as possible with the, most, with the right people involved and the most information available. The second mindset that I, that I approach decision-making is using a decision tree. Now, this is one of the common literatures available out there. So when you think of a decision, there are basically four levels. So a decision can happen at a leaf level, a branch, a trunk, and a root level. Now, the four stages represent trust that can be delegated, 
uh, and a degree of potential harm or a potential impact or an action a company can take related to each of these uh, four levels of decision making. So the first level is leaf decision. You make a decision, you act on it, you just move fast. And the outcome is you don't have to report on these kind of decisions. For example, creating a new ticket or updating a page are just quick decisions. You don't have to report it that you created a ticket. Yeah, we have to let the team know, but there's no reporting happening. The second one is branch decisions. So you make a decision, you act on it, and you report the action you took. Now you can report it on a daily, weekly basis. For example, if you made a corrective change that impacts your sign-up flows or conversion flows, you definitely want to take a look at it in terms of what is the impact being, how is your MAO, or what are your funnel metrics looking like. The Trump decisions are the ones that start getting deeper and more complex. So you make a decision, and before you finalize on the decision and act on it, you discuss it with multiple parties, involve stakeholders, and make sure that everyone is informed of the pros and cons of a certain decision being made. Because once you chop off the trunk the wrong way, the tree is going to fall. It may be good, it may be bad. You'll only know when it starts falling. And the last kind and the most complex sort of decision levels is the root decisions. So the root decisions are, are grounded in the company's not just objectives, but the fabric. So when you make decisions, you make these decisions jointly with input of as many people as possible. There is adequate checks and balances that goes in making such decisions. And these could be, for example, sunsetting a product, maybe starting a new product initiative, spinning off, spinning off a division and such. If poorly made and implemented, can cause major harm or negative impact to the company. So when you think about decisions, think about what level of decisions you are making and what are the kind of actions you want to get out of it. The one other framework that I use a lot and I encourage a lot of PMs and teams to do is the DACI. Simply broken up, DACI is driver, approver, contributors, and informed. Now, I found this one to be most useful and one of the most practical ways of making decisions and laying out the options on the table. So. Uh, they, they can be some decisions that are very complex, have a lot of dependencies, need a lot of team players and a lot of experts weighing in. So a DC provides a very structured way, an objective way to have one driver for the decision making, one or multiple approvers. You can definitely have more contributors helping create the document or create or soliciting all the requirements to the decision making and the people who should be informed or who, who will be impacted as a result of the decision being made. So a DACI framework provides a well-structured, thought-out way to make decisions that could be both simple, uh, which is like a one-way door decision, or uh, sorry, uh, a complex one-way door decision where you cannot get back, or a simple two-way door decision like an A-B experiment that you can turn off. Now, regardless of where you are in your journey as a PM, there are heaps of decisions of all shapes and sizes that you will be making. And this just not, does not just mean the decisions for your product, but decisions for yourself too. Now, I'd like to spend a lot of time on this topic. Maybe it's a good topic for a different day, but I'll quickly try to cover up some ground while we're on this slide. So when you, when you think of your journey as a PM, you might want to think about the kind of choices you will make that shapes the outcome of your PM skills uh, with with respect to your strength. The first one is the style of influence. Uh, P, it's, it's, being a PM is, is a great job. Being a PM has come with a lot of responsibilities, a lot of fun, but there are many flavors to being a PM. You could be a, a design-led PM or an artist. You could be an engineer or a scientist you know, in mindset as a PM, or you could be a general manager as a PM, trying to manage all the things from go to marketing, to packaging, to pricing, and also people management. So early on, you need to, based on your style and based on your approach, what is the kind of PM you would like to be? And you don't have to stick to any one type. You could, for example, in my career, I started off as a design PM, where I was very closely involved in helping design some of the most iconic products that I worked on. And then later on, I'm now more of a scientific PM, uh, where I, I worry about platforms and their capabilities. And at some point I would like 
and definitely want, want to be a general manager kind of PM where uh, my decisions spread across not just a particular design or a engineering area, but across price packaging, which I've had a fair share of in my, in my career. So being able to decide the style of influence, the style of PM you want to be, and being able to iterate and try a few out before you actually settle on one would be an advice that I would give uh, because the similar advice was given to me by my mentors almost a decade ago, which has really helped me shape uh, my plans and decision makings for myself. The second one is learning plans. Now, this may sound like a loaded word, but it should not be. Learning plan is basically how do you want to learn and grow as a PM? What are the choices you want to make to to hone your craft and make it better? Do you want to inspire or lead teams or do you want to master more of product management craft skills? Do you want to be a great communicator? Do you want to get into storytelling? You need to have a learning plan and you need to have a plan that goes with it. For example, do you want to build on your people's skills? Or, you know, why not start mentoring people out there or mentoring folks who want to be product managers or want to step into product management? There are many avenues, online training programs, being part of an APM program if you're not still a PM. Uh, so I would say, have a plan, have a learning plan. This is, this is not an enforced curriculum, but being on top of the curve and deciding what are the kind of things you want to learn will definitely help shape you as a PM. And last but not the least, the customer mindset. When you're doing so many exciting things, uh, it's just natural to to be on a roll and think about technology and designs and outcomes. But I would always say, keep the customer front and center. Always start with the customer mindset. As you create features, as you define key metrics or North Star metrics, as you help huddle teams and make complex decisions, always subject yourself and your teams of walking in the customer's shoes, uh, being, being where they are and how would they rate your product? Or how would they rate what you did if you were to rate it yourself? So that is also a decision uh, which you and only you can make. So as a PM, you may be making great decisions about the product, but you need to make decisions that help shape you and how you want to grow as a PM. All right, so I think I covered a lot of ground. Uh, let me just quickly do a summary of all the things we discussed. So systematically overcoming your cognitive biases is one of the things you have to be cautious about. Uh, you know, while we can get into the loop of some of these or many of these biases, uh, keeping a lookout and practicing some standard methods to avoid these biases is maybe the first place to get started. And don't worry, I've made, I've made heaps of mistakes myself. And I'm very thankful to the organizations and my mentors to help me correct it early on. Remember the key dimensions of your product decision making. Own the velocity of the decision because you don't have to own all the decisions the depth. Be very clear about the kind of decisions you're making. Is it a leaf decision, a branch, a trunk, or a root? Based on the kind of decision you need to make, go into the depth of it. And ownership. Are you the driver? Do you need to be informed? Are you the approver? Uh, do you need to find an approver? So all these things have you know blurry lines, but being mindful about who owns the decision and, and who are the people who can help him or her make that decision in the fastest possible manner is what you can do as a PM. And when it comes to your career, decide early and revise often. Figure out your style of influence, figure out the kind of PM you'd like to be. Lay out a plan, decide the things you wanna learn in the next quarter or the next year or the next month and always have a customer mindset. This is not a decision, this is, this is a mandate of sorts. Always think about customers, no matter what you do and how you do it. Uh, at Atlassian, we follow playbooks a lot. So these are open resources uh, that, you know, I suggest some of my customers and my team members to take a look at. It's totally optional, but this provides you certain frameworks of deciding objectively and making the best decisions for you and your products. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you, you found some value in this webinar for this. Webinar.